But I'm glad you are turning to God's Word, because that's where we get fed. Now, at times when we go to God's Word, we don't always feed on what we like. Same as when you're feeding your children, they come to the table. You don't always give them the food that they want, but you give them the food that they need. In this passage this morning, as well as in chapter 4, we're going to receive much about what we need. And I hope you hear what God might be trying to say to you this morning. Remember, this letter was written to Jewish Christians primarily. Now, some of them were true Christians. Matter of fact, in chapter 3, verse 1, we are told that they're holy spiritual brothers. And then look it down in verse 12 of our passage this morning. They're just referred to brothers, physical descendants of the Jews. There's a big difference between being God's people, simply being a Jew, or someone who has come to Christ. And these Jews had come to Christ. Some of them had not. All of them gave the appearance that they turned to from Judaism, their old way, and had come to Christ. But because of the intense persecution, because... Uh, of their uh, the persecution came as a result of their commitment to Christ. They were certainly constantly aware of their old way of life still intact. The temple was still working. It was uh, viable, usable. Their faith was being practiced by many. And when this persecution came as a result of being committed to Christ, many of them turned away. They turned away from that commitment to Christ. They wanted to return to what was more comfortable, their Jewish faith. They also wanted to turn because it was more comfortable not being persecuted. And so Paul's trying to encourage them, don't, don't turn back. What you have here in Christ, there isn't anything better. Continue to trust him. Continue to turn to him. But too many of them turned to Christ, but they never made a full commitment to Christ. Now they were frustrated. What do we do? We're experiencing this difficulty. We're experiencing our, our surroundings. What do we do now? Do we continue to go forward or do we go back to what is comfortable? And that's not much different than what they had experienced previously in their history. Matter of fact, God delivered the Israelites from Egypt. When their situation became
If you find yourself an angel, you can hear the angel speak to you and tell you the things of God. John, how will I find a word from God? John says, well, get depressed. Go to an island all by yourself, and God will begin to speak to you. How are you going to hear God speak? Do you need a bush, a burning one? Do you need an angel? Do you need to lay on your side for over a year? Do you need to get depressed and go in isolation somewhere? Perhaps. But God made it very simple for us. John wrote, as I say, the Bible is written from God, but in the book of the epistle of 1 John, we are told that we have the anointing on us. The anointing is reference to the Holy Spirit. Jesus made it clear, if you want to listen to God, listen to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. The Spirit that lives within us will teach us. The Spirit who wrote God's Word will connect with you and me and teach us the things of God. You see, the Bible is inspired by God. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, men wrote as God inspired them. So what we have in this Bible is a message, a word from God. If we don't have this basic understanding, then we are really in trouble at the very foundation of our faith and salvation. See, Scripture is from the Holy Spirit, who reveals to us the mind of God, as we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Without knowing the mind of God, we are unable to know God. And without knowing God, we do not have eternal life. Jesus said it this way. He said in John chapter 17, verse 3, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and your Son, whom you sent, Jesus Christ. That word know, kenoso, is a Jewish idiom for sexual intercourse between a man and a woman. It's more than a head knowledge, it's an intimacy with God. The same word is used when Mary could not understand how she could be with child because she did not know a man. Well, obviously she knew a man. There were many men around her. But she did not know a man intimately. And for her that was confusing to think that she could be with child because she did not have that intimate relationship with a man. You and I, if we're going to truly be saved and be truly God's children, we must have an intimate relationship with Him, and that is knowing Him intimately through His Word as His Holy Spirit teaches us about Him and about who we are in Him. So, verse 12, without knowing God. The Holy Spirit says, listen, without knowing God, we turn to evil. We trust an unbelieving heart. We depart from the living God. And a departure from a living God leads us to embrace evil and wickedness. It also reveals what we love and what we trust the most. Sin, self, our temporal life, our lusts, our passions, prestige, comfort, prominence, popularity, all these things are more important than Christ. So, listen to God. Open up His Word and listen. Let her be. Take time to hear from God. Take time daily to hear from God. Look at verse 7 again. If you today, if you hear His voice. Today, if you hear His voice. I think that's a reminder for you and me to listen daily. If today, you hear his voice. Listen to God every day. And when you listen to God every day as you open up his word, expect him to speak to you. And I'm confident if you do that on a consistent basis, you will begin to have the voice of God speaking to you. And when he speaks, respond to what he says in obedience. You see, it's today. Soon today will turn into tomorrow and when tomorrow comes it's too late for today we can't harden our hearts if we don't take the opportunity now our hearts will become hardened if we don't on a daily basis meet with god in his word see the israelites in the wilderness used to gather manna every day every day they would go out it would be all over the 
the ground and bushes, they'd pick it up, they'd start eating it. Some of them thought it would be a good idea to s store it and save it for tomorrow. Well, if they didn't use it that day, when they went to use it the next day, it was all rotten and useless. So you need to learn a practical spiritual lesson from them. Just as they trusted daily for the Lord to provide for their physical sustenance, we must turn daily to the Lord for our spiritual sustenance, which gives us, like food gives us spiritual strength, or physical strength, going to the Lord each and every day will give us spiritual strength. When the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? And he says, begin with giving the Father glory. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. And then he says, give us today, give us our daily bread. Can we have a word from you so that we will be sustained spiritually each and every day? So listen. Listen to what God wants to say to you. Open up his word. He wants to speak to you today. Number two, listen to God strengthens our faith. Listen to God strengthens our faith. Now realize this, and I've said this before, and it's a wonderful quote. It's not mine, but I use it often. Faith that is not tested is not faith at all. <coughs> Write it down somewhere. Faith that is not tested is not faith at all. It has to be tested. The Duke of Wellington was approached by an inventor trying to interest the Duke in a bulletproof waistcoat that he made. It was absolutely marvelous and could save the, group, the great Duke's life if someone tried to assassinate him. So the Iron Duke had the man try it on and then to test it, he sent for a rifleman. At that moment, the Duke darted out the back, I mean, the inventor darted out the back door. Don't be surprised when this great faith you claim that you have is tested. If it is as great as the Bible claims it is, and you and I claim it is, it will withstand any test that comes along. And those tests are good. When we face those challenges, that's a, a good thing. God allows these adversities to come to us, to keep us from trusting ourselves and to trust in Him and rely on Him alone. Our faith is strengthened. Letter A, it keeps our hearts penetrable. Isn't the Word of God active and alive and sharper than a two-edged sword? It wants to pierce the very marrow of our lives. I mean, it pierces the very conscience, our thoughts, our motives. It wants to dig deep into you and me. As the more and more you and I open up God's word, the more it's able to penetrate us and keep our hearts pliable and penetrable. Uh, there's a custom that often happens of branding animals. Such things as needles will pierce the hide of a cow until it's branded. Then after that, it's nearly impossible to do so. See, God created you and me with a conscience so that we would know our need for him. God cannot penetrate our heart or our conscience if a person chooses to turn from God and his word and harden their hearts against him. If they do so, they will not be able to hear from him. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. He says, a hypocrite's conscience, they're sheared by deceitful and evil teaching. They listen to everything else but what God wants to say. As a result, like searing, searing a piece of meat, to sear a piece of meat, you take that hot iron or grill, and you take the meat, and on the one side you put it down for a brief period of time until it's brown, and you Flip it quickly till it's brown again. That's what seals in everything. And at that point, nothing really gets into the meat. If you haven't marinate, marinated at that point, you're not going to be able to. And the same thing with God's word. If you and I keep turning to other things rather than him, our conscience, our hearts will become impenetrable. They'll become seared 
and we'll be incapable of hearing what God wants to say to us. So staying in God's word keeps your heart sensitive to the things of God. Let her be. It keeps us trusting God. Look at verse 8, the latter part, and verse 10, the first part. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said they always go astray in their hearts. Rather than trusting God, they were testing God and questioning God. They put him to the test for the purpose of approving him if he should meet their tests. They saw all of his works for 40 years, the magnificent things that he did, and they couldn't trust him to provide for their physical needs. You know, people often ask, will God bring me through this? Why did God allow this? If your heart is penetrable, evident by your trusting him through his word, you'll see how God will bring you through it just as he has brought you through things in the past. In chapter 17 of the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 7, it's the actual reference that Paul uses here that's found in Psalm 95. It tells us when the entire Israelite community left the wilderness from, from sin, they're moving from one place to the next according to the Lord's command. They, they camped at Raphidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. So the people started complaining. Moses, we need something to drink. What did God do? Did he leave us here to die? And God said, no, Moses, I got a plan. And he stood on a rock in front of Moses. Not God actually stood on a rock, but he was there in that place and told Moses just to strike the rock and they'd have their water. They thought God had brought them out there to kill them. But God was going to continue to provide them right in the middle of their great need. And the passage ends with them questioning, is God among us or not? Is God here? Is God in the middle of your situation? Is God in the middle of your circumstance? Is God in the middle of your trial and your testing? He's right there with you. Promising what he has promised throughout Scripture, that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And let her see, listening to God daily will keep us from grieving God. The word says that they were in the rebellion. That means to irritate, exasperate, or aggravate. Who were they irritating, exasperating, aggravating? God. And verse 10 tells us they provoked or angered God. Now, I don't think that's a great thing for you and me to practice. When God tells us something, he expects us to read his word. He expects us to obey what he, we hear. He expects us to trust him. And when we don't, In verse 31 of chapter 10 of the same book, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And if we do, experience the anger and the provocation of God, we are left wandering and we will not reach that place of rest, that place of milk and honey, that sweet place of trusting God no matter what. Is it sinking in? Good, then your hearts are where they're supposed to be. Penetrable. All right, number three. Listen to God to encourage others. Now, you take the great step, the leap of our faith, you know, in, the sense, in this sense that, yes, I am so thankful that I'm saved, but I'm also concerned that others aren't. And I'm also concerned that others who claim to be Christ aren't trusting him each and every day. And that's a concern for me, and I hope it is for you. But we can make a, a difference in people's lives. Letter A. Know God's way to share his way with others. Look at verse 13. But encourage each other daily, while it is still called today, that some, none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Letter B. Know God's way to set a faithful example. Not only do we have an opportunity to share what God's word says, but you also have the opportunity to live out God's word 
And I love to see that lived out in people's lives. That's so encouraging to me. Not only to hear from them how they're trusting God, but to watch them trust God. Paul told young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he says, set an example to the believers in speech, conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. In the fall, Linda was traveling up the rutted and rugged highway from Alberta to the Yukon. Linda didn't know that you don't travel the white horse alone in a rundown Hobbit, uh, um, Honda Civic. She set off with where only four-wheel drive normally go. The first evening, she found a room in the mountain at the summit, and uh, she asked for a 5 a.m. wake-up call. She couldn't understand why the clerk had that funny look on his face until she woke up the next morning and realized that the whole mountain was shrouded in a fog and, and the snow had set in. Well, she didn't want to look foolish, so she got up and went to breakfast. When she went to breakfast, there were two truck, truck drivers there, and they invited her to join them for breakfast. Well, the place was so small, she felt obligated to join them, so she sat down. And they asked, them, asked her, where are you going? And she said, the white horse. In that little, little civic out front? No way. The pass is dangerous in, the, in weather like this. Well, she said, I'm determined to try. It was a gutsy but an uninformed response. I guess we're just going to have to hug you. Well, at that point, she recoiled and said, you're not going to touch me. He said, laughing, he said, no, we'll put one truck in front of you, one in the rear. And that way you'll get through the mountains. See, that's what Christians need at times. They need a hug from their brothers and sisters. See, the Bible tells us, and later on in Hebrews, that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. I no doubt believe that passage is talking about past saints that have gone on before us. But I think it also refers to you and me as present saints. Someone, someone, here and now, needs to hug God's people. Someone setting out in front, setting the example. Someone behind, encouraging with God's word. You see, geese fly in what's referred to as a wedge. They take turns flying out in front. Those behind, we are told, honk words of encouragement. I have no idea what they're saying, but apparently someone has determined this is encouragement for those who are in front. And in front, those who are setting the standard are setting a standard by a faithful example. So that's what we need to be. We need to be hugging one another. From behind, honking with encouragement from God's word. And out in front, leading by setting the example. And when we know God's word and we know God, we are capable of doing both. Because knowing God is to be obedient to what he says. And when you know God's word, you handle it rightly, and then you're able to share it with those who are in need of that encouragement. And let us see, knowing God's way will encourage perseverance. Look at verse 14. For we have become companions of the Messiah, that's the Christ, if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. Perseverance. Perseverance in a Christian's life is the defining characteristic of the reality of their salvation. They always persevere right to the very end. Those who are born again will continue to trust Christ forever. According to Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 39, no one can bring a charge against God's elect. No one can separate the elect from God's love. God works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And God, all he saves, he glorifies. Perseverance is evidence that you and I belong to him. We'll hang in all the way till the end. In John chapter 10, verse 27 to 30, the sheep, Jesus says, his sheep, his people, they hear my voice. They follow me. And I give them eternal life, and none of them will ever perish. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. In John chapter 6, verses 37 to 47, we're encouraged with the same words. 
Everyone, Jesus said, the Father gives me will come to me. They will come to me and I will raise them up on the last day. They will persevere now and forever. Look at verse 15 of our passage this morning. As Sebastian already read, I'm going to read again. It reiterates what we have just been talking about. Today, if you he take time, hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who hardened and rebelled? Or who heard and rebelled? Wasn't it really all who came out of Egypt under Moses? And who was he provoked with for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, those whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And who did he swear that they would not enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were all, they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Departure from reading God's word, studying God's word, obeying God's revelation is a very departure from our faith and salvation. Departure from spiritual strength. It's a departure from knowing God, knowing God's direction, his way. And it's a return to evil and a trusting of sin and self rather than God. We will face uncertain days. Amen? You may be going through them right now. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. The Bible tells us that if you follow Christ, you will be persecuted. As you go through difficulties, you may hear someone say this, and you oftentimes scratch your head, what do you mean by that? When someone says, give it to God. And the question is, how do you give it to God? You may, have, you may have asked that question. How do you give it to God? See, if you have not given your life prior to that difficulty, through a relationship with him, through his word by faith, you will be confused and you will turn to and you will trust everything else and everyone rather than him. Jesus said, come to me, those who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Learn from me. Learn from me. You will find rest when you surrender yourself to the Lord. I'm not saying surrender yourself to the Savior. The Bible says you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And then you're saved. You confess. You surrender to him as Lord. And as Lord, guess what he does in your life? He gives you a hungering and a thirsting for righteousness. You hunger and thirst for his word. And as you read it, he begins to allow you to rest trusting in him. You'll find your rest only when you trust Christ. And as you trust Christ, you will find your rest each and every day and in the future by taking him at his word. Oftentimes we call it prayer. Prayer is not asking God for things, even though we should ask him. But we ask him those things that he places on our hearts. Jesus said it this way, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. The prerequisite, remain in me, and my word has to remain in you. Now you have the resource to ask. And when you ask, he says, I'll give you anything and everything in my name. Prayer. Prayer is not asking only. Prayer is also hearing what God has to say before you say anything to God. And I'll guarantee you this. God will give you rest for your soul if you trust him in prayer in that intimate relationship with him. Father.